Welcome everyone. We'd like to thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Kaylee Lowe and I'm the head of digital marketing at the International Luxury Hotel Association. I'm here with Michael Dringas um, from Merchant Advocate and we're taking you through a very exciting topic today. So our mission at the ILHA is to promote growth in the full service hospitality industry for owners, operators of hotels, cruise lines, private residences, and other luxury hospitality organizations. We grow your business by connecting you with our network of experts, thought leaders, and innovators. And I'd like to personally welcome you all to today's webinar. So today is brought to you by Merchant Advocate, and I'd like to introduce you to Michael, who'll talk about their service and how they're assisting hotels right now on saving money through payment processing. If you have questions, we'll answer them in the chat. Um, we'll, we can also answer them through email um, after the webinar, and Michael will get back to you. Um, so yeah, let's get started with today's discussion. Over to you, Michael. Perfect. All right, well, thank you very much for the introduction. So if you can hear me out there, go ahead and clap once. How about twice? Uh, see, I'm wondering how many people actually clapped there because you know, I know the audio is muted, but the reason I did that, at least if you're clapping now, you know, at least I got a round of applause, so I guess it really doesn't matter about the content, right? Mission accomplished. No, I'm only kidding. So we're really grateful to be here working with the International Luxury Hotel Association and bringing some very valuable content to each of the attendees here. And today we're going to talk about this silent equity partner that businesses have but they don't always know that they have it. And it's regarding that complex world of merchant services. Now, like most any type of business out there, if you're a small business owner or a CFO or a controller, a couple key words that will really create an emotional reaction in a not so favorable way are credit card processing or merchant services. Whenever somebody hears those words, there's this level of frustration and angst and the reason for that is because it's an unregulated industry. And business owners and those that are operating businesses, they're bombarded day after day, week after week, month after month, by these sales individuals trying to sell these processing programs where they say, hey, switch to my provider, we'll save you some money. Well, in actuality, because there's no regulation, typically the way the scenario works is, an agent will come in, they'll write up some favorable rates on the merchant service agreement. Then the next month when that merchant statement arrives, you look at the bill, you look at the merchant service statement and you see, okay, your rates did indeed go down, but your cost went up and you're right back where you started from. So this creates a situation where businesses, they need to accept credit cards because they have to. I mean, face it, we're moving to more of a cashless type society the impact of coronavirus. I know everybody on this, on this call has certainly experienced the adverse impact and people are really reluctant to hand over, have an exchange of cash. So credit cards and debit card transactions are becoming more and more of an operating reality for any business. So you accept credit cards because you have to, but nobody really wants to because there's these silent equity partners behind the scenes. So we're going to kind of peel back that curtain and explain to you some areas that you really need to be aware of to make sure that you're not being taken advantage of and that you can protect your bottom line. Because in reality, that system that allows you to collect money could be costing more than it should. Because again, it's an unregulated industry. So when we talk about payment processing, credit card processing, the entire ecosystem, it's important to note first off that there's actually two sides to merchant services. There is a regulated side, that's the issuing side called interchange. Now, essentially what interchange is, it's approximately a thousand rules and regulations established by Visa, MasterCard, American Express, and Discover that outline the hard cost of the credit card transaction, okay? So that's fixed, that's regulated. Then you have the processors, okay? The acquirers or the processors. Those are the entities that actually adjudicate the transfer of funds. They're the ones that pretty much move the money from point A to point B, okay? That side is unregulated. Now, there's something that's very important to be aware of is the fact that even though interchange, that regulated side, 
is fixed, it's regulated, and there's measures of control there, the same transaction can have four different tiers of pricing based upon coding and data flow. Now those tiers of pricing can vary by as much as one and a half percent, which means if something is fundamentally in error on the issuing side, if there's a coding error or if there's a gap in, the, in data flow, your organization could be paying one and a half percent or more too much before the transaction ever even reaches the processor. Okay, and we're gonna talk about this a little more in further detail during this presentation. But it's important to know that you can't just look at the processor side, those that are charging you the service fees. All those interchange details are very, very important. And your processor, your credit card processor, is never going to look at those details because they're not compensated on interchange. They simply transfer the interchange cost to you and then add their service fees. So you can look at interchange kind of as the buy-in cost. So they, they transfer that buy-in to you and then mark it up accordingly to meet their, their needs. Now, in that entire ecosystem, you see there's several different acquirers or processors listed here. However, it's almost a misrepresentation of what we see in the real world because in the United States alone, there's really only about five true processors. All these other companies are resellers or ISOs, and you can see there's an overlap here. We see ISOs and MSPs. What those are is those are independent sales organizations that actually resell the processing offerings. Now, this is important for you to be aware of because a lot of times an organization will say, oh, no, we process with our bank. You know, for example, let's just say TD Bank as an example, okay? Well, the merchant statements may indeed say TD Bank in the top corner, but TD Bank is not the processor. They're actually an independent sales organization reselling for First Data, which is owned by Fiserv, you can have these different hierarchies where whoever you believe or whomever you believe that you process with might not actually be the processor. So there may be two or three other parties upstream that are also taking a piece of every single transaction. So it's important to be aware of that. You do have your issuers, you've got your card networks, everybody's familiar with Visa, MasterCard, that's tied to interchange. So the networks are pretty much the vehicle by which, so they're, they're pretty much the transportation system that funds are trans, transported through. And then the processors you can view as if the card networks are the railways, the processors are the cars, the locomotives, okay? A lot of different players. By the way, you did see gateways there. What a gateway is, is sometimes when you transact, you'll either use an actual terminal, a chip reader or a card swiper where the card is physically placed into a device, or you can also type in the information on an electronic terminal or a virtual terminal, which is known as a gateway. It's just another delivery system to pass the information from point A to point B. We'll go into that a little bit further down the road too. When you look at the life cycle of a transaction, it starts with the customer naturally. They go to make a purchase or they put a deposit on a room or they're booking an event, whatever the case may be. Um, the order comes through and the gateway or the credit card terminal will pass that request. The processor links it to the appropriate association, which will then go to the issuer. They'll approve or deny the transaction based upon available funds. And then the customer is billed. We're all pretty familiar with this. It's very similar, you know, regardless of which side you're on, if you're on the purchasing side or the receivable side, it's all the same players. All this happens literally in fractions of seconds, typically, okay? Here's the need to know. The need to know is credit card processing is both regulated, that's that interchange or issuing side, and unregulated. That's the processor side or the acquirer side. Again, that side, they're the ones that actually adjudicate the transfer of funds. Now, it's important to note that margins have been compressed. And when, when, you, when you see this line right here, margins have been compressed, driving processors to hide fees. We're actually going to walk you through a few examples of what to look for on your merchant statements and why it's important to look for them. Because in the past, there was a lot of opportunity for credit card companies and processors to make, to basically charge whatever they really wanted to. And there still is some latitude for that. But as rules and restrictions and regulations came out to defend and protect consumers and business owners alike, 
processors just got a little more clever in terms of what they're going to disclose versus what they're not going to disclose, creating many different loopholes, which enables them to change the rates pretty much whenever they want. They just push out a little statement message, which is in a super, super fine print when you read your merchant service statement. Typically, it's about five to 12 paragraphs long. All a processor has to do is notify you that there's going to be an increase. Now, most, most CFOs, controllers, business owners don't read that information because there's a, a lot of nothing in that, in that small print. Um, but as long as they notify you and it's not contested in writing, you're stuck with an increase. So at any time, a processor can say, hey, rates are going up. And unless it's contested in writing, you're stuck with it. Now, here's the problem. Most times, you can't really dispute that increase because if you're still under contract, if you have a contractual obligation with a minimum term, well, you're beholden to that contract. And unfortunately, what most people don't realize is when you sign up for merchant services, even though that document is only about five or six pages long, by signing it, there's fine print typically either in a sentence or paragraph right underneath the signature line that states that you're agreeing to terms and conditions set forth in something called the program guide. Now, in all of my experience with merchant services, I have never encountered anyone that was proactively given the program guide. Typically, it has, you have to ask for it. But it's important to know because the very first paragraph of program guides typically state that by signing the agreement, that three to five page document that the sales agent crossed out certain rates, put more favorable ones, by signing that, you agree to the terms and conditions set forth in the program guide. Collectively, they account for the entire agreement. And in that first paragraph, it states that no strikeouts, uh, strikethroughs, crossouts, alterations, or addendums will be honored. Now, what this means is if a sales agent comes in and they have a pre-populated merchant service agreement and they're crossing out the rates that you see and they write lower rates, and if there's a minimum term and they cross out that minimum term and say, okay, um, we're going we're gonna to have zero term, zero cancellation fee, it really doesn't matter what they wrote and the, or what matters is the fact that you signed it because by signing it, you agree to a whole other set of documents that you have to ask for. And in most occasions, that document clearly states that any of those changes will not be honored. And the processor reserves the right to change rates whenever they do. I know we spent a lot of time on this particular slide, but it's very important to understand that this is an operating reality. This is one example of one of those loopholes that processors use because they're disclosing the fact that the rates will change or that they might not be consistent with what you agree to, but they disclose it in such a manner that it's borderline deceptive. Uh, you really have to ask. It's so important to become educated on this so that you're not overpaying. Processors do change rates about four times per year. Uh, interchange goes up twice a year in April and in October. The April increase this year was actually postponed until this month, actually, but another one's going to hit the books in October, and you'll see the impact of it in November. It's important to know that because whenever, process, whenever interchange goes up, that is clearly communicated to everybody that accepts credit cards. And since you are notified that your expense is going up, processors typically take advantage of that time to slip in additional fees of their own. Because when you get your bill and you see your cost went up, you are just going to naturally go, oh, yeah, that's right, interchange went up. Where in, in fact, there may be some additional increases. So it's very, very important to look at the details of your merchant statement every month, or at least have somebody that can really scrutinize the details to see when this is happening. Another thing too is, you know, breaches. We hear about these security breaches all the time. Uh, you really can't grab, a, a, you know, a dominant newspaper in any marketplace without at least once a month hearing about some sort of security breach. So we're going to talk about PCI compliance, why it's important to you. When you look at that complex world of processing, a lot of people get caught up in rates. Oh, I have the best rates. Oh, I've got the perfect rates. My processors been, I've been with them for 20 years. We have the best rates. It's not just about rates. It's about your total costs, okay? So you might have great rates, 
But if there's a batch fee, an authorization fee, a monthly PCI fee or non-PCI fee, a statement fee, a security fee, an internet access fee, as you can see, there's a lot of different fees that can be imposed at the processor's discretion, which can really drive up that cost. So it's important to understand what a valid charge is and what is just really what a processor feels like charging you because they can. Now, there are different pricing structures. Some of you on this call may indeed have what's called flat rate pricing or tiered pricing, where it states, okay, for X type cards or X transaction types, you'll pay this rate, and for others, you'll pay another rate. <clears throat> that's not always, a matter of fact, I've never seen where that's the best program, because what they're doing is they're averaging up the interchange costs so that you are actually paying more in the long run. Coding is very important because every single industry out there has its own unique standard industry code, okay? And we find situations where a sales agent for a processor will go out there and they'll have a pre-populated application for services that is the, the retail box is checked off. Well, if you're a hotel or if you're in hospitality and yet the box is checked off for retail, your transactions are not being coded correctly. You may be paying a higher amount in interchange. In terms of case studies, we've actually had a few clients. We had a media company where, and this is how important coding is without going into the details. One coding error that we identified was costing an organization over a million dollars per year. And that coding error was so deeply embedded in the details, and they've been paying this for years very important to have somebody work with you or have somebody on your team that's going to look at all these details and make sure you you have optimal coding. Now, does this always mean that the processor messed up? No. We've had situations where organizations technically could be coded for a few different things. I mean, you know, face it on site, you may have a restaurant, you know, is, does a restaurant get coded as restaurant? Does it get coded under the hierarchy of the hotel? You know, we have to look at the details to really see what the best fit is. But a prime example is we had a case study where there was a theater, a performing arts theater, that was coded as a theater. Right? That, that makes sense. They're a theater. However, upon further inspection, they're also nonprofit. They were a 501c3. Well, when we looked further in, we modified their code, their SIC code, to a nonprofit which saved the client about $72,000 per year just in, one, in that one modification. Was the processor wrong by checking theater? No, but was it optimal? No. So there is a degree of, of variability there. That's where discretion is required and it's helpful to understand the complex world of credit card processing. We talked about rate versus cost. The other thing is, you know, who is your sales agent? Very regularly we hear, oh, you know, my, my brother-in-law or my sister-in-law handles my credit card processing. Okay, well, you may indeed have the best rates on the processing side. What we found, however, though, is most sales agents for credit card processors, they're, they're not trying to take advantage of you in most cases, but once terms are agreed to, agreed upon, and you have specific rates in place, all somebody above them has to do is flip a switch and your rates just went up. And that person that is your sales agent, they might not even be aware of this trend. Yeah, we find situations where we talk to a sales agent on behalf of the client and they're scratching their head saying, there's no way this is happening. And that's actually why Merchant Advocate was created was because we realized there's no measure of control in the merchant service world. And think about it, I mentioned earlier, Okay, if you're processing through your bank, for example, who's actually a reseller of this super ISO, who is a reseller of an actual processor, well, if somebody up here flips a switch and raises the price, it's going to affect everybody downstream. Are you being told the truth? I mean, does your processor really know what the details are, uh, or are they trying to, to, to play the, the slate of hand type, uh, type scenario? We see both. Um, we've had certain circumstances where processors will compress the merchant statements, which means when you get your merchant statement, instead of it breaking down what your card mix was and how many different types of Visa cards or MasterCards that you, you'd receive, 
it just lumps everything together and does not disclose the interchange costs. To our team, that's a big red flag. If somebody is not disclosing all the information, well, chances are they're hiding something. We do see this quite regularly. And the processors really don't want you to know everything because an educated consumer, then you can, you can then challenge what you're being charged. Uh, if you've noticed when you get your merchant statement every single month, it might as well be in a foreign language. I mean, it is so complex. <clears throat> there's, there, there's almost no continuity to it. And the interesting thing is, if I printed up 10 different businesses' merchant statements or 10 different properties' merchant statements and put them all side by side, the only common theme would be they're all on paper and ink and they're all confusing. But they're all going to be confusing in different ways, which is done deliberately because processors know that if they push out the information in a format that you cannot understand, it just becomes the cost of doing business. So it's important to have somebody that understands that language that has those, those special lenses, so to speak, that they can see through and understand what the details are. All merchant accounts are not equal. Again, a lot of this is related to your SIC codes. Oops, sorry, I got a little happy here scrolling through. Um, you know, and the SIC codes are typically programmed upon setup. Again, one code is not one size fits all. It's important to, to have somebody set up your account or retool your account that truly knows the way that you should be coded. Again, interchange is fixed, but there are ways, even though it's fixed, there's those four different tiers of pricing, which are based upon coding and data flow. So it's important to understand the way that that data flows through the system and communicates to ensure you're getting the best possible pricing before it ever even hits the processor. We talked a little bit in the very beginning about gateways versus standalone terminals. Again, the difference is a terminal is an actual machine that you either use the chip reader or you swipe the card in and that transmits the transaction. Yes, you can hand key a transaction into a terminal. You will pay a higher cost on the interchange side if you do that without putting in certain fields of information. So if you're tempted or if your staff is keying in a transaction and you see them just hitting enter, 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 passing through certain prompts, it would be beneficial to have them put in the data that's being requested in those prompts. Could save you as much as a half a percent right out of the gate. EMV, when you look at terminals, are they EMV compliant? Uh, Recently, in what recent few years, we've all received those cards that have the little chips in there. Well, the chip is a security measure. You really want to make sure that your devices are EMV compliant. And the reason you want to do that is it protects you in the event of a disputed charge. So if there's a contested charge, but that chip was red, then it shows that that card and individual were on site, right? Whereas if the transaction was hand keyed, well, you can't really prove that, that the card was physically present in that environment. So be sure to use the MV whenever you can. It will protect you in the case that somebody tries to dispute a charge. And when you look at costs on the, on the whole terminal versus gateway, it really depends on how you're transacting. Are most of your transactions done with card present or are they done with card not present? Uh, you may have a mix. So for example, if you're taking reservations and you're accustomed to putting the transaction into a terminal, again, you're going to be paying a higher interchange fee. You may want to consider having a gateway where then you can plug it into the computer system. It will ask for different information, which will ensure you're getting that lowest possible cost. It will ask for specific security information. But net net, if you have a card not present transaction, being delivered through a card not present network, which would be a virtual terminal or gateway, you're protected. If you have a card not present transaction go through a card present environment, meaning you have your hand keying into a terminal, that transaction can be readily disputed. So EMV, we did speak about. Uh, again, absolutely, your terminals should be EMV ready. Uh, it is recommended that be on an IP line. So sometimes we have merchants or clients that are still using telephones, telephone lines to, to connect their devices. We do re recommend using an internet line for that just because the amount of data that's transmitted all at once 
that little EMV chip does carry a lot of information, which again will protect. If you're using a gateway, a virtual terminal, some of them are EMV ready, where literally there's a little USB connected device that plugs into the computer and you can actually run the card and it will populate the card data into that electronic terminal or that gateway. Um, or make sure you put your security information in there. Make sure you're putting in, if it's asking you for street number or if it's asking you for zip code or if it's asking you for CVV, whatever the prompts are, be sure to complete those, which again will protect you in chargebacks. PCI compliance. We hear about PCI compliance all the time because every single year, your organization has to do this PCI survey. And you have to take a little test, you know, a 10 to 20 question test or quiz, if you will. And then a signal will be sent through your system to assess the integrity and make sure that it's not vulnerable to breaches. A lot of times individuals go, Hi, you know, I don't have the time for that. I don't even understand what they're asking on the test. And I will share with you, I have taken a few of those PCI compliance tests. I don't even know some of the answers, what they're asking for. But your processor will connect you with a helpline. PCI certifications are done through a third party. There are resources. The reason it is important for you to become PCI compliant is because the processor doesn't want you to become PCI compliant. Let's think about that for a second. Processors make money off of every single transaction that you conduct, right? Why wouldn't they want you to be PCI compliant? For a few reasons. Number one, you're already paying an annual PCI certification fee. Whether or not you're certified, you're going to pay a fee. It can range anywhere from $100 to $700, okay? We've seen them even higher, believe it or not. So you're paying for the rights to be certified. But every single month that you are not certified, the processor gets to charge you a non-PCI fee. And that can vary from anywhere from $29 a month to again, $699 a month. So processors really don't want you to become PCI compliant because it's just a money maker for them. It's literally an industry inside of an industry. It used to be that if a, if a card transaction was contested, the credit card company would assume the liability, right? Now, if an organization, if your property is not PCI compliant, the liability shifts back to you. And if there's a security breach, the liability, again, if you're not PCI compliant, shifts back to you. So you definitely want to make sure that you're PCI compliant. It will take, you know, it might take a half hour to have somebody on your team complete that assessment. And again, you can ask your processor for direction in terms of who they use for support. The processor cannot give you the information. Merchant advocate can't give you the answers. Uh, it's against the law. Oh, it has to be done through third parties. But make sure you get it done because you're going to protect yourself in case of security breaches. <clears throat> and you're going to save yourselves money so you're not getting that monthly non-PCI fee. Just point of fact, $4.2 billion impact in 2016 for data breaches. The, the fees for a data breach, if you were not PCI compliant, can be tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of dollars per occurrence. Can't emphasize the importance enough. We covered PCI. Let's talk about reporting a little bit because you get this monthly merchant statement. It's very confusing. You're trying to make heads or tails out of it. Well, I will share with you, there's two different ways that processors can impose their fees, their service charges. They can do what's called a daily discount, which means every single day you'll have a roll up of your transactions and you'll have a roll up of the associated fees. Or they'll do what's called a monthly discount, which means at the end of the month, they look at your transaction history and they impose their service fees accordingly. From an accounting standpoint, and if there's any controllers or CFOs, here on the line that are on daily discount, you're probably gonna be shaking your heads right now. It is so difficult to balance the books if you're on daily discount. Because what happens if you have a refund or if you have a chargeback and then you have to go back and find the originating sale and back out you know, the, the transaction fee. And there's a lot of work that's involved. I encourage everybody, if you're not on daily, if you're not on monthly discount, 
you may want to ask your processor to move to a monthly discount program. It will make your bookkeeping that much easier. And to me, it's a, it's a cleaner view. It's very easy to see what the roll up and the activity of the month was. But I talked about, hey, if you had a disputed charge or charge back and you're on daily discount, you had to look back. That draws a, another point to the front. And this is very important because we've, we've encountered this at Merchant Advocate. We've seen this on many occasions. It's so important to have somebody look at not just your transaction fees, your costs, your expenses. I'm going to give you examples momentarily. But when you have those refunds, is there an offsetting sale? So there was one instance we had where there was a hospital network we were helping, and there was an inordinate amount of refunds. And they weren't for tremendously large. They were you know, anywhere from $30 to $120. It's not like they were super large refunds. But when we did our due diligence and we're analyzing the accounts, we couldn't find any offsetting sales for those refunds. Well, evidently, a member of this team at the hospital, one of their employees, had access to one of their credit card terminals and would occasionally stick their card into the device and put a refund through. They'd process a refund, but there was no offsetting sale. They were literally stealing money from the organization. So it's important when it's bad enough that the merchant service world is complex enough, you do have to, to account for human nature. It's important when you have returns or refunds to really check and make sure that there is an offsetting sale that that refund can be directly aligned to an actual transaction, okay? When you sign up for merchant services, I had already mentioned the program guide. I'd already mentioned the fact that it almost doesn't even matter what rates you agree upon because the processors reserve the right to raise those rates whenever they like with fine print notification. And again, if you're under contract, you're kind of, you're stuck essentially. Um, or if you're using software, and we see this a lot, especially with hotel properties, we see it with, with the uh, hospitality industry, with medical, with restaurants, and some retailers too, where you might be using a POS system that requires you to use a certain processor. Well, typically there's an integration cost because <clears throat> both the processor and the software are making money off the same transaction. And there can be some additional fees and penalties involved there if you're, if you're unaware, if you're not really inspecting the details. Again, it's so important to have somebody really look at the details of your merchant services. But when you look at your contract, when you sign up, oftentimes you might sign up for a three-year period, but then there's an auto, auto renewal for another three years. Now, this is very important because some processors or processing entities Instead of the flat rate cancellation fee, they charge what's called liquidated damages, which means if you're going to cancel, they're going to hit you with a bill that is equal to whatever they would have made during the duration of that merchant service agreement. So if you're processing with company X and you fulfilled your three-year agreement, and let's say it's three years and one day, and you're like, oh yeah, you know, I want to change processors, you go to change, you might not be aware of the fact that you're, you're under contract for another three years just due to inactivity, just because you did not notify them. And then you can be hit with you know, several tens of thousands of dollars worth of fees to exit the relationship. Very important to understand that this can happen. We see it quite regularly. So important to have somebody look at your account. Um, price locks is another one. <laughs> Some processors do offer price locks. That's great because what that means is whatever markups you've agreed to, they're going to honor them. It's important to ask if you are looking for processing, see if they have a price lock program, but have somebody inspect the details and make sure there's not these additional fees hidden somewhere else to make up the difference that they would have made over time on a higher rate increase. This is not too applicable right now to the hospitality industry, but I want to make everybody aware of this because I'm sure there's going to be some sort of creative way that this will happen. So in the medical world, they receive medical practices, hospitals, they receive insurance, right? And insurance companies then owe money to these practices. Well, what insurance companies are now doing is instead of cutting, you know, cutting a check or sending an ACH remittance, they're actually sending out a one-time use virtual credit card. I want to make you aware of this 
Because what happens then is when the practice or the hospital or the organization goes to accept their payment, the reimbursement via this one-time use credit, you know, electronic credit card, they're losing about three and a half percent because of the way that it processes. It processes like a specific business rewards credit card. To add insult to injury, the insurance company gets a rebate of about one one percent to one and a half percent on the back end. So here insurance companies are paying practices at an already discounted rate. It's costing the practice money to accept their own money and the insurance company is making money off the money they sent them. You can see how this can create a lot of frustration in the medical world. Just be aware of this right now. I'm sure somebody's going to figure out a way how to use this in the hospitality universe as well. Now, I wanna give you some hard examples. We had talked about the two sides of merchant services, the regulated side, the interchange side, that even though it's fixed, it is variable because there's those four different tiers of pricing, which can vary by as much as one and a half percent based upon coding and data flow. So that needs to be treated when, when somebody's looking at your accounts, and Merchant Advocate does this, but when, when somebody's looking at accounts, it's so important to look at the interchange details first to make sure that you're paying the lowest possible cost before the transaction even moves. Well, then it's important to put the spotlight on the processor side, that unregulated side. Now I've mentioned unregulated probably about a half a dozen times. I'm gonna show you the impact of what that really means. So before you, this is actually a merchant statement. It's one of our clients' merchant statements that's redacted for privacy. Now it may or may not look like yours because again, even though there's only about five to six processors in the US. The reason I say five to six is there's a couple mergers that are still being finalized. There's about five processors. There's thousands of resellers, again, that are all just reselling the same product and they all push their statements out in a different format. So yours may look like this, it may not, but the information should be pretty much the same. Right here on this first red highlighted line, this is, this is a discovery our analyst team has made. You can see there's two transactions, volume is $3,120. And right here it says Visa rewards 1.70% and 15 cents per item. Now, what that is, is that's the processor saying, okay, the interchange cost of this card is 1.70% and 15 cents. And then on later pages, they disclose what their markups are. But there's a very big problem with that because the cost of that card is not 1.70 and 15 cents. It's actually about 1.65 and 10 cents. So right in plain sight, that processor is hiding an additional 10 basis points and five cents worth of profit, okay? We see this all the time. And this is so important to know because a lot of times people will go, oh, I got the best rates. I already have the best rates. Well, you may have the best disclosed rates, but what about these hidden markups? And there's no way that a small business owner, a CFO, a controller, a treasurer, there's no way they're gonna be able to catch that without spending an inordinate amount of time determining what tier, what, what the interchange cost should have been, what tier it should have adjudicated at, what was actually charged, seeing, you know, reverse engineering the math, comparing the difference. There's a lot of work involved to identify these hidden fees, but they exist all the time. Some other examples that you need to be aware of, there's situations, let's say somebody books a room and then they cancel it, okay? When they book their room, naturally you're being charged, if you're, if, if you're, if you're charging the credit card at that point, or if there's a deposit fee, you're paying credit card service fees, okay? And whether, you know, whether it's retail, hospitality service, whenever a transaction goes through, the processor takes their piece again. But in many circumstances, we see that if that transaction is refunded, the processor takes their piece again. So literally, you're stuck paying twice on a transaction that in effect never even happened. So if you look at these values right here, and there's a few hundred dollars worth of charges that really in a perfect world should be zero because in, in effect, there was no transaction. Transaction went through and then it was reversed but the processor took their piece, whether the money was coming in or coming out. My favorite example of really why Merchant Advocate was created to, to drive this fairness and transparency and why it's so important for you to, to, at least if you can't do it yourselves, have somebody 
look at the details of your merchant statements is this line right here. You can see there's a fee for $92.02. And as a descriptor, this fee is called discount expense for credits. I don't even know what a discount expense for credits is supposed to mean because a discount sounds like it's helping you, expense sounds like it's hurting you, credit. It's a made up fee. And the processor charges this because they can. We see this all the time. Some other areas that processors get quite clever, because remember we mentioned that margins compressed, so processors have gotten creative in hiding fees. So you've already seen where they can, they can mark up interchange without telling you, they can charge a transaction on the way in and the way out. They can make up fees. Well, there is a third component because we're dealing with numbers. We have the regulate, you know, we got the, excuse me, sorry. Uh, we have the processor, but what about the math? Because you're dealing with numbers, you have mathematical equations. Who's challenging the math? Well, this example right here is actually from one of our professional sports teams, uh, Major League Baseball. And you can see on the second highlighted line, their list of Visa Signature Preferred Card, there's a 2.95% interchange cost, which is true in this one. This is not inflated like the other example. Uh, 10 cent transaction fee, total fee of $228.95. But what do you see for volume? What do you see for number of transactions? Zero. And we all know that X times zero equals zero. Well, how could there be a charge? It's a quote mathematical error. And if you actually, for those of you that are detail oriented, if you actually calculate and run the math on this one, it's not $145 and change. It's actually about $91 and change that that should be. So right there in just two lines of that, and this particular sports team's merchant statements are about this thick, uh, and they save hundreds of thousands per year, but just those two lines, you're looking at thousands of dollars per year in overage and spend. So it's very, very important to be aware that these type events occur all the time. Just another quick example. There was a situation where we had optimized a client's account, Merchant Navigate had optimized a client's account, where their interchange rate for a specific transaction type was lowered from 2.70% to 1.80%. When we validate it, that that change was indeed had gone into effect. Yes, it's listed there. Okay, guys, we corrected it. But when you run the math, the math didn't add up. So they changed the upfront number, but did not change what the true fee was. So, I mean, there was a difference of $181 that this client was being overcharged. Now, if you think about it, most times, if, if you know something's agreed upon, you, you look for what you expect, right? So naturally, the business would expect, okay, they said they're going to bring this to 1.80%. They look, okay, there it is, good. Let's move on to the next item. It's so important to have somebody really look at the details. And that's why we were created. But have somebody, at very least, look at the details. Because without doing so, you can find these situations where there's overages and costs across the board. The other thing is it's very important to not just when you identify an opportunity and co to correct it, it's very important to continually monitor the account. And here's an example of a situation where our team worked for an account, we lowered their cost, okay? And, and uh, if you're familiar with that boardwalk game, Whack-A-Mole, where the mole pops up and you have to whack it down, I always joke that our analyst team Literally, they might, it's like they're playing whack-a-mole with a paddle in each hand and one in their teeth because whenever a processor makes a concession, let's say they lower a rate, that mole gets popped down. All of a sudden, a new fee pops up. That gets whacked down. Now there is a statement cost. That gets whacked down, and it happens all the time. This is an example of where rates were, were identified to be inflated. Our team worked to lower the rates. And literally within a few months, the rates went right back up to where they were before. So it's very, very important to not just look at the details, understand the details, correct the details, but to continually monitor that account. Without doing so, you will be paying too much. So this presentation is designed to be educational. It's not promotional. This is really to make you aware 
of the various nuances and places that processors can take advantage of. Now, Merchant Advocate, you know, this, this is our organization, I just want to call out very importantly, how do we differ from a processor? Well, number one, Merchant Advocate is not a processor. Matter of fact, we're processor agnostic. We don't care where an organization processes, we just care that they're paying the lowest possible cost with fairness and transparency. So our goal is to drive fairness and transparency in the marketplace. Our founder and CEO actually started in the merchant service world. He led a very, very successful team selling merchant services. So he was one of those ISOs that went out and said, hey, you know, if you switch to me, we'll save you some money. Great customer service, high level of integrity, would bring people to the smallest of margins, literally only a couple basis points over cost. But then what he found was somebody upstream would flip a switch, his client base, their rates would go up. It made him look bad. It made him seem like he was breaking his word. So he wanted to stay in the industry. This is over 15 years ago. Came up with the idea of, okay, you know what? If the industry's broken, what can I do to fix it? So when we partner with an organization, it's very simple. We drive that fairness and transparency in the marketplace. We don't switch your processing relationship. That's important. So processors, they want to switch you to their offerings to save you money. Merchant Advocate is not a processor. Processors, they want to put as many fees and costs in there as they can to make money. Merchant Advocate is only paid, only compensated when we save a client money. It's completely self-funded and cost-free, no upfront fees, simply share in a portion of the savings that are generated by our solution. So if there's no savings, there's no fee. And if there is savings, there's still no cost because we're just sharing in the success. So net net, our clients walk out with more money in their bottom line every single month. And then if you look at processors, I mean, customer service and other issues, they, they can really reflect negatively upon the whole organization. A lot of this has to do with training. A lot of times reps aren't trained. Merchant Advocate, again, we're, we're, we're relationship driven. We're educational driven. The client is always the focus and there is no monetary gain for our team unless we save you money. So that's about as much as a commercial as you're going to get, because again, this is meant to be educational. But if you'd like to hear more, certainly you're going to have our contact information momentarily. Uh, we did discuss some case studies. I do want to share just, just top line. There's a major New York City merchant advocate touches every single type of entity across all realms from the small mom and pop to the Fortune 50. Um, we've got clients literally that are doing tens of billions of dollars per year, billions with a B, to the ones that are, you know, just, just, trying to make some bread, the ones that are doing maybe 10,000 a month in merchant service volume. One of our hospitals, we actually saved hundreds of thousands of dollars per year. Uh, I know it's not really, it's not a direct correlation to, to your industry, so I won't go too far into detail. But what is important to share with you is we found hidden fees that were costing over 200,000 a year and were able to secure a recovery of funds. Most of our solutions are on the go-forward basis, meaning when we work with, a, with a, a client, we work with their existing processor. Again, there's no switching processors. We lower your rate moving forward. If you were paying, for example, 3.5% all in, uh, we get you to 2%. You're benefiting from that savings on the go-forward. But when we find those mathematical errors or when we find those any sort of egregious breach in contract, then we'll seek recovery for you, too. This particular hospital benefited from a significant recovery of a few hundred thousand dollars. So our solutions aren't just on the go forward. They literally are retroactive as well. Where we find these examples where the processor is playing with the math or playing with what was agreed upon. Um, you know, here's another hospital example. Uh, again, in this case, just the key call out. The rates, we talked about uh, rate structure before. They were on an incorrect structure. We talked about how you can have a, a tiered rate or flat rate pricing. It was not optimal for this particular organization. We helped work with their processor to put them on the best rate program. 
which saved them a significant sum of money. And we have clients literally in the hospitality space. We've got casino clients, casino hotel clients uh, that save you know, tens of thousands, several tens of thousands of dollars per year. Um, we've got certain hotel chains where there's, there's been group management organizations where we've helped multiple properties. Sometimes we'll give the name of an organization we help with, other times we won't. We never will without the permission of that client because our client's privacy is highly respected which is why you really didn't hear too much in, in, in terms of names, but feel free to visit our website and you'll see not only client testimonials and case studies, but you'll see a lot of big names that you're probably quite familiar with. The most important takeaway for you is have your merchant services audited. Whether you do it yourself, whether you reach out to merchant advocate, make sure somebody is looking at the details. Not only audit it, but monitor it because just because you've had corrective measures and concessions were made, we all know that those rates are gonna go right back up. Rates go up three to four times per year. So you can guarantee that if an issue is identified and corrected, another issue is going to arise, whether it's a mathematical error or a coding issue or a new fee or just a plain old increase. Make sure you're PCI compliant because again, if you're not PCI compliant, you're putting yourself at risk um, for steep penalties via if there's any breaches and you're paying too much in these non-compliant fees and protect yourself from breaches. If your processor has a program where they have breach protection, it's worth looking into. Some of our partners that I can share with you, Florida Institute of CPAs, they're a client and we're a member benefit provider for them. So if you think about that, we have accounting and JCPA on there as well. If accounting associations were so pleased with our service and they're willing to bring it to all the accountants and they're willing to bring it to all their clients, there must be something quite viable there. Um, in dentistry, we have the Office Managers Association, Optometric, more dentists, veterinary, ADP. There's, there's several, and there's, there's too much to fit on this page, but the purpose of that page is really to share with you. We're experts in this industry but we're not part of the industry. We're part of the solution. Everybody has a, the problem. We all share the same problem when accepting credit cards. You're losing money every transaction. There's no fairness and transparency. How do you stop those revenue leaks? How do you put that money back into your bottom line? That's why we're here to help. That's what we do. So thank you for your time. I'm going to open it up to questions. I appreciate everybody's uh, participation and patience, but I'm looking through the chat box. I don't necessarily see any questions. Um, Kaylee, if you see anything on your end, can you let me know? Nice, Michael. Thank you so much for such an informative um, and educational webinar. That was really, really, really helpful. I think a lot of people have submitted a couple of questions. Um, one, for example, here is said, um, what can a typical hotel expect to save? Obviously you covered a lot of this in your um, case studies, and I think it's nice to know, I guess, in that context. So it, it, it's interesting because a lot of times we hear, hey, what, what can I expect to save? It's difficult to give a numeric value because hotels have different volumes. They have, you know, there's a different card mix. What I can share is we typically save our clients between 30 and 40% of their cost of accepting credit cards. So we do have some hotels. I, I know there's a couple of Best Westerns that we work with that, you know, it's a smaller, it's not what I would call a luxury hotel, but they're, they're certainly fine properties. Um, where in those cases, you know, it may be several hundred to a few thousand dollars per month um, for a few properties. And then we have some more of that luxury based casino hotel type entities that are saving anywhere from $3,000 all the way up to $10,000 per month. Uh, it really depends on the size and scope of the organization, but typically we save our clients between 30 and 40% of their cost of accepting credit cards. Excellent. I mean, who wouldn't want to contact you after the webinar? <laughs> 
Um, I'm going to ask you just one last question and then everyone else that submitted a couple of questions will obviously get back to you over email. There'll also be, um, you know, the recording sent out with Michael's email address. So you can ask him directly. Um, but the last one, um, how often do you provide reviews? Great question. So when we engage with a client, <coughs> we go to work immediately. We immediately begin implementing solutions to lower the cost of accepting credit cards, and we educate our client as well. So we do all the work. That's important to emphasize. We do all the work. We're going to educate you and your team in terms of what we identified and the solutions that we're providing. And then every single month, you'll receive a, a detailed analysis report, which will show you not just the savings that we generated, but where that savings came from. So literally our team every month will, will download the merchant statements. Most of our clients wind up giving us online access so we can do literally all the work. We'll download the statements, we'll do the review, go line by line, identify and correct any issues, and then send the statements and the analysis report back to the client. The way the program works is the client literally gets 100% of the savings up front. It's proven and validated by that monthly savings analysis. And then, and only then, do we remit back for our portion. So really, when, when we engage, our authorization form is really more to protect us because the client's getting 100% of savings up front, and we need to rely on their good faith to make sure they remit back our portion. But, uh, but yeah, monthly, monthly analysis are completed. Excellent. And I guess it's something that, you know, you want to keep doing regularly so that you don't get those fees going up again. So I think... To everyone that's joined us today, um, thanks, Michael, for giving us such an informative session. Um, we really appreciate your time, and I think a lot of people can benefit from your service. Um, be sure to share this webinar with any colleagues um, that might benefit. Um, and we'd also like to encourage you to get involved with the ILHA and share your expertise. You can network with us and grow your business, um, you know, meet people just like Michael, um, if your business actually would benefit from his services. Um, we'd like to invite you to join us as a member, as well as to our upcoming conference, where we're going to be giving some awesome networking opportunities to attendees. We've got free virtual passes available for those that um, want to attend and invite colleagues. You can find it all at inspire20.com. You can also go to our website on the ILHA.com and find a copy of the webinar under events. Um, and if you become a member during the next two months, you can also attend the conference and have a virtual um, VIP pass for free along with your ILHA membership. So join us at the ILHA.com and we hope to see you again soon. Thanks for joining our webinar today and thanks, Michael. We really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Looking forward to helping everybody. Uh, listen, we do a complimentary analysis. All we need is a few months worth of merchant statements, and we can let you know if you qualify for services. Our goal is to help and to protect your bottom line. Thank you very much. Thanks.